saw in the last lecture, your, uh, there's similar plotting for the channels and the components, one's on top, one's on bottom. So um, some of these are going to be repeats from last lecture. Um, but we'll start with running ICA. Okay, so this should have been in the last lecture. So you know now to retrieve data sets through the data set menu. And if you want to reload your data set, you can go to file, load existing data sets. And also, as you figured out, we didn't give you the raw data. We gave you easy that data sets. Okay, so like I mentioned before, there's two ways to reject continuous data. These are the same function, just different places in the menu. Okay, so to reject continuous data, so if you've epicked your data and stuff, you should get rid of that in your MATLAB and reload the continuous data. So the way that you reject continuous data is if you're scrolling along, you see something like this. You, you push your mouse button down, and then you drag it over the messy part, wherever you want to start and stop, and then you lift up the, the mouse button, and now you've selected that portion of time. So before you were cho choosing epics, you just click once and it takes the whole epic. Now you have to drag over the time period that you want to delete. And same as before, if you're done, so you can select this and keep going, scroll your data and select more parts of the data that you want to get rid of. Uh, and then at the end, if you want to reject those, those data bits permanently, then you press reject. So for preparing for ICA, the general rule is that you want to reject large muscle or otherwise strange artifacts or events. And that means stuff like this that's, um, you know, maybe sometimes questionable what you know whether it's very large or not um but but maybe in this display i would get rid of these points i'm going to keep stereotyped artifacts like eye blinks because ica is very good at taking those out and that's the better way to do it than getting rid of perfectly good data so places like this you want to keep and even muscle sometimes is okay to keep um and these these parts that i rejected to be large artifacts it's just because it's going through all of the channels. If it's just, you know, your uh, your temporal electrode that that has a lot of muscle, ICA might be able to take that out. So, independent component analysis. I'm sure um, you've gotten the the details of this this morning. But just to review, when you start out with channels over time, that's what we call X the scalp EEG. And independent component analysis is a process of finding a matrix W such that W times X equals U, or the component activations. Component activations are the same um, uh, X and Y values as the channels, except for its components over time rather than channels over time. So all that is is just a rearrangement of the channel data into different component activations. And this is a linear operation, so you, um, if you multiply the inverse weight matrix by U, then you get back to the original data. Um, the inverse weight matrix is, you know, just this W um, inverted, and that's how you get the scalp projections. So it helps you know where it's coming from in the head, and you know, later on you'll learn how to uh, um, fit an equivalent dipole to these scalp maps. So the secrets to a good ICA decomposition are fairly few. So first of all, garbage in, garbage out. If you have absolute nonsense data, there's very little ICA can do for that. So you want as clean a data as possible. Like I said, you remove large non type artifacts over short periods of time in the, in the task that you were using. And then the other thing that we run across frequently is um, whether people have enough data. So sometimes they're trying to run ICA over, you know, two minutes of data and they have 70 channels. And that's just not enough time for ICA to understand what are independent components. So you want to make sure you have as much data as possible when you're doing the decomposition. So if you've kind of done everything else uh, and it, you're still not getting good information, you might want to look at how many channels versus time points you have. So the more channels you have, actually the more time points you need. So you know at SCCN they have 256 channels, and in order to decompose that, you need close to an hour of data to get really good components out. So but the fewer the channels you have, the less data you need. But like I said, when you get very few channels, it's sort of a, um, it's questionable whether you're getting real independent data there. Does that make frequency better? I mean, 
Um, no. <laughs> so it's, it's like time, right? So just, just having more frames doesn't do it because it's really repeated information. Yeah. And then the high pass filter I mentioned is, is necessary if there wasn't an amplifier high pass, and that's because ICA just can't handle those slow drifts around zero or off of zero. Removing bad channels, it, it, bad channels don't actually make ICA break. It will just take one of your dimensions for that bad channel, and you're really not helping anything by keeping it in. There's other ways to deal with it. So in the study, they'll it'll interpolate, or the other option rather is to interpolate over a bad channel. And so you've kept the, the number of channels equal. So if you want to compare across subjects, that becomes easier. Um, but you do lose a dimension of the data. So in that case, you'd ha you'll have to PCA the data before ICA. And I'll show you that option in a second. Uh, but that is, that is the other option for bad channels. But you just really, you don't want to keep the noise in the data. And then this is sort of something from years ago, but we realized that you can't have data in single precision for the run ICA function. And I think it's pretty standard now that it's always in double. But again, if nothing else works, make sure that your EEG.data is in double precision. So the run ICA option is under the tools menu. And there's uh, at the top here, you can choose multiple different algorithms. Um, we usually use run ICA, that's sort of standard one. Benica is also uh, very comparable. It's usually basically using the same InfoMax algorithm. It's just much faster. It, it runs all the data in Linux in the background and not in MATLAB, so it's much faster if you want to run through subjects very quickly. But then there's also other algorithms you can play with as well, but we like we prefer InfoMax. The options that you can input here, uh, the first one is extended. So extended means it's going to look for subgaussian components. Generally, that means it's looking for line noise. So it's going to try to isolate line noise into a single component. It doesn't usually succeed. You'll oftentimes find line noise in other components that are otherwise good brain components. And if you really don't want that, you should use clean line first, and you can maybe get rid of enough or all of it so that Extended isn't, doesn't even matter at all, and you won't see 60 hertz anywhere. The stopping rule is, um, is a, a weight change where ICA will stop at, so the default, I think, is 1 times um, 10 to the minus 7. And that means that it, it's the weight change from one step to the next has to be small enough. Um, it, has to be larger than this. If it gets smaller than this, then it's going to stop and say, yes, this is the decomposition, this is the end. And if you make this a smaller number, so if that was 1 times 10 to the minus 8, it's going to go longer because it's requiring a smaller step change to end. The learning rate is determined from the data. Usually, you just want to keep the default. Um, if you want to play with it, the general rule is that if it's too small, if the, the learning rate is too small, it's taking very small steps to get to the, the end, and you might never get to where you need to go because the step size is so small. If, you're, if your learning rate is too large, it might keep stepping over the final destination. So I don't, I don't, I don't play with the learning rate, and I don't, I don't think it, nobody that I know plays with the learning rate, but, um, but you're welcome to change it if you want. Max steps is another stopping rule if you, um, if you want to limit how many steps it goes to, then you can change this. Um, the default used to be 512. It may not be anymore. Uh, th generally, this is not the way I want ICA to stop. I, it's maybe nice to have it there in case you, in case something goes wrong and you don't want to crash MATLAB. But, um, but I would rather it stop because of the stop rule and not because of the max steps. Also, the max steps, you need more for more channels. So if it has more data to go through, it's going to take more steps, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So usually I make the max steps something very enormous, so it's not going to be the reason that it stops. And then the PCA option is uh, will reduce your dimensionality before it runs ICA. Um, <clears throat> and it will automatically do this if it finds that the dimensionality of the data is smaller than the number of channels. 
So if you interpolate a channel, it's going to find that dimensionality is one less than the number of channels. So it will automatically do this. Um, if for any other reason your dimensionality is, is lower, so for example, if you had bridging between two electrodes, that you've now decreased the dimensionality by one because that's the exact same data. Um, so if you find that it, it PCA'd and you didn't want to, you might want to check your data and make sure there's not something you want to do um, differently about your data set. Um, you can also do this if you have an enormous number of channels and you don't have a lot of data. So that's the other option. So if you have um, you know, 128 channels but you only have 10 minutes of data, you can either decrease, you can delete channels or you can PCA. And there's arguments to be made for both. But, um, and well, hopefully you get basically the same answer out. And then when you press OK, you'll see this kind of display in the MATLAB window. It will tell you each step, what the learning rate was, what the weight change and the angle um, change was. And what you should see is these weight changes going from a larger number to a smaller number, and then finally at the end, when it gets to the stop rule, it will end. And what it does is it's going to sort the order, sort the components in descending order from the projected mean variance. So things like eye blinks will be generally your number one component because it has the largest variance. And then as you get to the later components, their their variance is very small, so. Um, they may not be the ones that you're most interested in. Typically, it's the later components that are mixtures or um, really uninterpretable scout mounts. And then when ICA is done, it updates your EEG structure. And the EEG, um, the ICA data goes in these fields, so ICA acts, ICA winds, ICA sphere, and ICA weight. The ICA winds is uh, the scout map, so wind is the inverse weight matrix, and that, that shows you what the scout projections are. The, um, so the, the weight, or the W matrix, is a combination of ICA sphere and ICA weight. So you have to multiply those two together to get the actual w, w matrix. Um, I think the default now is that the sphere matrix is made to be identity, so that everything is transferred to the weight, but um, but you want to make sure that you're, if you want to see the actual W matrix, that you're multiplying those two together. Okay, so now I'm just going to go through different plotting options for ICA components. Okay, component ERPs. Um, the simplest way is to look at them in a rectangular array. So you can choose all the components, like here, and you can see very quickly what uh, ERPs look like for all the different components. And you might be able to find something that's interesting just looking at a glance here. You can also plot them with component maps. And to do that, I'm going to explain the data envelope. Um, I'm going to kind of take this tediously because it can be really confusing when you go between plotting options. So this is the same as what I showed you for the channel. So each one of these traces is a channel. And you know, as we saw before, you can take a moment in time here and you can see the, the component map there. If you go to the highest and lowest extent of all of these channels, you get what we call the envelope. So all that means is the highest and lowest ex extent of the microvolt potential at any moment in time. And to plot the components, we take out all of the channels and we just look at the envelope. And that's because every component has every channel. And the reason we don't plot the channels is what I'll show you in the next slide. So for example, I'm interested in component 10. And this is what it looks like when you're plotting component 10. So the, the, um, the black is the envelope of all the channels. The red is the envelope of just this component. So just this component has all of these channels, right? Because you, you know that these channels are a little bit positive, these are a little bit negative um, at some moments in time. So a component topography doesn't change over time. So this is always going to be the pattern. What changes over time is the magnitude. So sometimes this will be very high number, sometimes that will be, and when that's a high number, that's a negative number. Over time, that topography is going to switch. So sometimes this will be a very high positive number, and this will be a negative number. 
So the, top, the, the pattern doesn't change, but the values in that change. So, but so in this dis display, you can see how this one component contributes to the overall ERP that you can see in the black. If I was to plan, um, uh, plot all of the channels, it would look like this. So you'd have a bunch of colored lines within this red envelope, which you can see um, makes it a little bit messier, makes it a lot messier if you have two components you want to look at simultaneously. So here is component 10 and component 12, both plotted within the larger envelope in black. If I was to plot all the channels for component 12, it would look like that. All the channels for component 10 would look like that. So, so that's why we clean it up and just look at the outline. The outline then tells you, you know, for example, here, this is the moment when that component was relatively strong in its ERP. And so you know, like, um, or, or here, let's say, so it's so where it's pointing to by default is the largest deflection in the ERP for this component. So you know that at this time point, this was the maximally negative, um, and, and negative would be here, deflection of that component on average. So you know that it's about 150 milliseconds, this component was very active on average. So another, so to, to plot this from the GUI, you go to component ERPs with component map, and you can choose the time range to plot, and then zero to 600 here is the time range in which to find the, the largest components, or the largest contributing components. Just below that, you can request how many components you want to see. So within this 600 milliseconds, which are the components I should look for? which are the ones that have the highest activity. And this is what it would look like uh, for this particular data set. Um, so you can see where this dotted line is. That tells me where it looks for the largest components. You can see there's six here. That's what I requested. Um, there's a number of brain components here, but there's also artifacts. So this is a pulse component, and this is a blink. Next lecture, there, we're going to talk about artifact components and how to identify them. But you know, of course, I don't want this activity in this display. You know, I don't, I don't really care about the eye blinks, but I actually do want it taken out of my data. So if I go back to the GUI, pull it up again, I can list here all of the artifact components that I want to delete from the data or, or remove from the data before plotting it. And, of course, then the six highest components are going to be different. Okay, so I knew from the display before, I knew two and four were artifacts. These other ones I found in other ways. And I just want to get rid of all the noise before looking at the ERP. And so if I plot, you know, if I ask for six again, now I have six brain components because I took out all of the artifacts. And in this case, the ERP looked fairly similar. If you had a lot of blinks or something like that, you might get a really big difference in the, the black envelope here when you take out eye blinks, for example. But so here is a handy way to find out which are your largest components if that's if you're just exploring the data and you want to see which ones are contributing most. This is a very quick way to do it. Yeah. How would you get the brain variant of the eye blinks? Yeah. Um, that is uh, let's see. The the variance, the percent variance accounted for is what you're asking for, um, which we can calculate. Um, that is in the spec topo. Let me see if we get to it, and, um, and then I'll yeah. L let me get back to you on that. Okay, so if you want to look at the spectra for the components, you can choose the time range to, to plot, and um, this really is just to save time. The default is the entire data set. If you want to just get a quick gestalt, you can just choose a fewer number of seconds, milliseconds there. Um, 
here you can choose the, the frequency that you're interested in. So in, in this case, well, I'm going to ask for 10 hertz. And then again, you can ask for the number of components that are the largest contributors to that frequency. So that looks like this. So now each of these, um, these are also, uh, the, each trace here is a component spectrum. So we're just looking at the component activation decomposed into frequency space. This black line is just the frequency that I asked for. This is the map over the entire scalp. So it now it looked at each channel and it did the frequency decomposition for each channel. Just so you can see basically where on the head this, this frequency is distributed. So, you know, mostly in the middle of the back of the head, you have a lot of 10 hertz power. These other maps come from here. So as it drew a line down here, it just chose the five highest intersections here. So this is the highest power component at 10 hertz. And you can do equally for other frequencies. So if I'm interested in theta, I just type here six. And then same display. Now I see that the distribution across the scalp in general is up here at the frontal midline. And then the highest contributor is, um, is this number four, the first intersection here. The next one is the ERP image. So this is a very powerful tool. I'll go through just some of the options for ERP images. Um, first, to explain ERP image, for any of you who haven't used it before, this is the color coding of the actual single trial activity. So this is just EEG or activations over time. And so it, it's um, blue for negative and red for positive. So you can see here when it goes really positive, this is red. And you just color code each trial, and then you stack those all up, and that's the ERP image. By default, the ERP image is sorted by time on task, but there's lots of other ways to sort them, and I'll get I'll show you some examples of that. So this is the the basic ERP image, um, just a straight color coding of the EEG data. At the bottom, that's the average ERP, as you're all familiar fam familiar with. So that's just an average across this vertical um, axis here. If you don't smooth across this vertical axis, you get, um, for example, something like this. Um, you know, something clearly happened at this point in time. You can see it's kind of reddish yellow. If you smooth vertically, you can, it helps these features come out more strikingly visually. So this is smooth by 10 trials. So then you can clearly see this is this is very red, um, and and you can see that this is this is the predominant trend over the the trials. And it's I mean it's a little bit cheating, but it's also very much something that's that's there in the trend of the data. But it's maybe sometimes hard to see when you have a large number of trials, like over 600 here. This is just another example of the difference between different values for the moving average. So the top is basically not. Um, not average, the second one moving average of two, and then moving average of 10. So you can play with that with your own data and, um, and you know, maybe see different features and, and, um, and maybe see the trade-off between two and 10 or, or more um, moving average files. Okay, so this is the interface for a component ERP image. It's quite large. Um, the most important thing is you can choose your component and you know and press OK and you'll get a, an image. The other options you can choose are here the smoothing smoothing factor is what I was just talking about by the vertical smooth so that's averaging over 10 trials. This downsampling is only if you have a lot of of trials and you want to actually just randomly select different you know a subset of that but one means you're not taking out any. <clears throat> One of the um, most basic things to uh, to sort the trials by is the latency. So here you can choose um, an epic sorting field, and so it'll give you some options here if you press on this button. So usually you want to um, choose the latency, and then in the next place the event type. So you're looking for the latency of a button press. In many cases, you can you can do it on the latency of anything else, but a button press is the most 
logical one usually. You want to make sure that your event time range is after zero if that's what you're interested in. So sometimes if you have speedy responses and things happening in quick succession, if you don't make sure that this is zero, it might look for a button press before your event of interest. Um, of course, if you're interested in the button press before your time locking event, then you would say minus one to zero. So this constrains where it's looking for the event that you're sorting by. Okay, so if I was to plot component 11 with these parameters, then my event, um, my time locking event is here, and then the trials are sorted by the latency of this button press. So you get a nice smooth line here. And so, you know, this trial might have been the first one they did, and this one might be the last one they did. And so this order is dependent on their button presses, not on time on task. And so when you do that, you can see trends that come out relative to this um, sorting event that would not come out if you just plotted time on task. This axis here is not microvolts, it's activation units, which is um, essentially arbitrary. It's just a relative unit. So it shows you, you know, the average um, act activation over, over this, um, these trials. Okay, some other options for ERP image. Uh, this is sorting by phase. So when you say 10 space 12, that's looking for the, the highest amplitude frequency between 10 and 12 hertz. And here, the, the window millisecond means that you're, you're doing the phase sorting at zero time. In other words, the time locking event. So this is phase sorted. So if, if we phase sorted for alpha, between 10 and 12, you should see um, the, the events coming in, or the, the wave coming in at a diagonal, which means that it was random phase. Often when you have a time locking event, all the, the um, alpha lines up because you, that's what makes the ERP, is you have um, this activity that's, that's directly time locked to the event. And so this may be interesting for you, for example, um, you can see that at this phase, um, at, at, at when the time locking event happened around um, this phase, n this ERP was a little bit smaller than it was at a different phase. So you can ask very nuanced questions about the actual phase of an oscillation when the time locking event occurred. Okay, and the next one down, these intertrial coherence options. So one of the things this does is just gives you more information. It'll give you some statistics about your ERP. So again, if I choose alpha or between 10 and 12 hertz, it'll look for the, the highest magnitude frequency here. And you'll always have to put a significance level here. Otherwise, it, um, it, it won't take this option. <clears throat> and then here, the image amp. So amp is power, so it's going to look for whatever frequency it finds. It's going to show you the, the amplitude of the oscillation and not the activation units itself. So that would look like this. So this is phase sort of this is exactly the same as the last slide, except for you're imaging alpha here instead of activation units. It's still showing you the ERP here, and this is activation units here. But now it's showing you the earth or the power so um, this is the baseline power. And then it shows you just the relative power over time here. So you get a little burst of alpha power here on average over the trials. And then down here it shows you the intertrial coherence. So how consistent was that bump or that frequency um, locking over trials. And this is the, the frequency that it shows. So 10.99 was the highest power frequency in that range. Okay, so that's, that's the phase sorted alpha power. What, another thing you can do is you can amp sort, so this one isn't in the GUI, but you can write, type in here any option that you find in ERP image and it will implement it. So this one sorts the epics by amplitude instead of by phase. So this is the same data, now sorted by alpha amplitude. So this is again imaging alpha amplitude, 
And so now you can see that the alpha amplitude is highest at the top, lowest at the bottom at time zero, which is what I asked for. So, you know, this may or may not be relevant to your experiment, but these are just options to plot. So these are actually the exact same data, looks very different. Now if I go back to the GUI and I just unclick this image AMP, now I get the same sorting order, um, but this one's alpha and this is the activations. They're the exact same order. So then you can see, you know, up here alpha was stronger. You can kind of see it here, even in the lead up, you can see a little bit more alpha power. <clears throat> but the comparison of these could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to discover um, once you sort this way, maybe which child had low alpha and which child had higher power? Yeah. So that you have to do from the command line. And when you use e ERP image um, function rather than pop ERP image function, you can get all, all of that information. So you'll get a matrix of um, of the sorting values and you can go back to the original data and know which trial was which. <clears throat> it can get really complicated because all of these things are possible, but it is a very powerful function. And when you run this from the GUI, this is one of the rare functions that, in addition to the history that hopefully somebody has talked about, um, it will also always print out what the actual ERP image function is. So not the pop, it'll tell you exactly what the ERP image function was. So that makes it really a lot easier to go to the command line. So just look for that in your command window. Okay, and then finally the ERP, the IC Earth, and this is just a time frequency plot. So this is also in the plot menu down at the bottom in component time frequency. <clears throat> so, so here you um, choose the component, obviously, the time range to look at, and then here the baseline. Now this is a ba different baseline than the data baseline. So this baseline means you're taking out the power, not the um, activation baseline. And so this isn't going to change your data at all. It's not. Uh, it's not taking out information from the data. It's just. It's just a, um, a visualization tool. And I'll show you why. Why that's important in a second. Um, and then you can change whether you're using wavelets or FFT, and uh, and that happens all over here. Okay, so this would be this component, and this is the time frequency. So this is frequency, and this is time, and the color is power, or dB, um, decibels. And then the bottom is the intertrial coherence. So this is showing you that at these low frequencies, there's a lot of um, phase um, uh, time locking to the event of interest. And this is saying that. At this time point, somewhere around 200 milliseconds, there was increased power down at this bottom one, something like 5 hertz, and then a decrease in power in the alpha range around 500 milliseconds. Uh, it's important to remember that when you do time frequency, you lose points at the beginning and the end of the trial. So sometimes people are confused why we have such giant epics. So the default, I think you probably found, was minus 1 to 3 seconds or maybe 2 seconds. Um, and when you're looking at ERPs, you're like, why does that matter? And it doesn't matter for ERPs. You can have, you know, minus 20 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds, and that would be fine. If you try to do time frequency, power decomposition over that, there's not enough time for it to lay down all the, the spectral windows. So you might end up with, like, three time points that weren't off the edge of your time, time range. So if, if you run this and it comes back with something really uninterpretable, it might be because you don't have enough time. So if you want to run down to three hertz, for example, you'll need at least three seconds to have enough time windows to see before and after your event of interest. Okay, so this, this is ha um, choosing the baseline from between minus 200 to zero. And what you can see here maybe vaguely, is that since I chose this time period to be my baseline period, it should be almost completely green. You can see here there's a little bit of blue here. That's because this isn't part of the baseline. So this, when everything is made relative to here, this is basically zeroing out that period 
in the, in the frequency domain. So everything you're looking at is relative to that. So it's an important thing to remember that everything you're looking at is relative in power. So here my question is, what happened from exactly before to exactly after the stimulus? And that may or may not be a stable baseline. So oftentimes you'll have, you know, like I said, events happening in quick succession. So you see a letter and you respond, and you see another letter, you respond. It might be that right before your stimulus, you just had responded, and the screen goes blank, and you know, the subject knows that in 200 milliseconds you're going to get another letter. Well, you might have rebound activity that happens in that small period. So your baseline, if you only choose the, the 200 milliseconds before your stimulus, you might be looking at the off stimulus from before. So you always want to make sure you know what your baseline is. Sometimes the most stable baseline is to take the baseline from the entire epic, which um, here you can do, I believe by, by leaving it blank, um, you can choose the entire epic or just say from minus one to three or minus 1,000 to 3,000 milliseconds. And that will, that will um, even out the, the spectral baseline over the entire trial. And nothing is right or wrong. It's a little bit like the reference for your EEG channels. You just have to know what you're looking at. Okay. And then here also I've added a significance level. So now the, these data are masked for significance and that's done by bootstrapping. So it's basically saying um, <clears throat> compared to this data in general over the entire epic, how significant is it that, this, that there's an increase of power here and a decrease of power there? How consistent was that? So, so everything we see colored here is significant at the 0 0.01 um, p level, and the same with here. Okay, so this is the exercise. Um, so basically, um, you can choose whichever data set you want. There's one called Stern 125 hertz, and and then the simple oddball that you looked at before. So either one is fine. You know. This is just a time for you to explore the data and try these different plotting options. So what, you know, you can epic on whatever you want. Um, don't don't worry about it all being exactly right. Just make sure you get to a place where you can use some of these plotting functions. So you might want to you might want to epic and you know look at the data, use some of the stuff from the first lecture to reject noisy epics and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, but just make sure you get to the plotting so that you can you know, see real results there. And we have until 4.15, so it's about 15 minutes, and then we'll start the third lecture.